Greetings programs. My name is Michael Broadhead. Uh, I'm going to give you a little advance warning. This does get a little bleak at times, but I promise you the good guys win in the end. <laughs> Many of you have seen this image before of the plague doctor. To understand what's going on with that, it helps to have a little bit of context, which brings us to the aforementioned black death, or the, the alternate term for it, which I prefer, is the great mortality, because the years of listening to heavy metal have sort of leached the power of those other words from me. But, <laughs> Uh, the great mortality is pretty good. So the years, as we learned, 1347 to 1352, really the tail end of 1347. Uh, in those years, not just Europe, but, but much of the world experienced an incredible amount of disease and death. Worldwide, there were between 75 and 200 million deaths. And so that encompassed Europe and Scandinavia, Northern Africa, Middle East, and Central Asia. Now, that... 75 to 200 million figure is striking for a couple of reasons. First of all, that's a very, very big number. And just the European part, as Trey was saying, was at least 30% and some estimates say 60% of the population of Europe. So to get a sense of that, just look at the people on either side of you here tonight and consider that you know, 30 to 60% means one or two of you are gone. The other thing that's striking about that number is that um, is how imprecise it is. And that imprecision is due not only because of, of uh, medieval administrative practices were not exactly up to the standard of what we're used to today, but also people were dying too quickly and in too vast numbers for the living to actually keep track anymore. In fact, individual graves and individual funeral, funerals were no longer viable. In Avignon, the Pope went so far as to consecrate the Rhone so that when people die, the bodies could just be flung directly into the river and that would still constitute a proper Christian burial. burial. And this was necessary because the, the church yards was f were full. There was no place to put the bodies. So uh, uh, there were actually three periods of, of the plague, so the great mortality that we talked about. There was actually an outbreak of the pandemic in the 19th century that they called the third pandemic, and then the second is just defined as everything in between the first and third pandemics, which is kind of convenient. But as you can see from the numbers, it, it spans hundreds of years, and it really was a lot of small outbreaks that happened all over the place. Istanbul, in particular, had 37 distinct outbreaks during that time. So when we talk about the plague, usually or historically what we've meant is uh, the bubonic plague, which is spread by rats or specifically the fleas on the rats. And I will spare you the details of how that works and just rest assured that it is completely and utterly disgusting. Um, but <laughs> uh, it, modern analysis of plague graves has, has shown that it, it looks like there were at least three distinct pathogens, uh, the bubonic plague, the pneumonic plague, and the septicemic plague. And each of these had their own means of transmission and their own symptoms. And this is borne out in contemporaneous accounts where you see in different cities and different countries slightly different symptoms appearing in them. But at, at, during the Middle Ages, they, of course, didn't know about germ theory, so they weren't talking about pathogens, and they were developing theories as to what caused the thing. And there were any number of these theories, but the predominant one was bad air. Or miasma, exactly, or these pestiferous odors. Um, and there, there were numerous ideas as to what caused this. Uh, a popular one was, was that cataclysmic events had, had released the miasmas from deep in the earth. And there, the, another theory was something to do with the alignment of planets, which despite multiple sources makes no sense to me still. Um, but, but so that was the concern about the bad air that during the second pandemic led a guy named Charles Delorme to come up with the plague doctor regalia that we're used to. So it was in the early 17th century. And in this getup, the, the long nose of the mask, in, in addition to being really awesomely creepy and evocative, was actually functional. I'm slouching here, so I'm going to adjust the mic. Posture, there we go. All right, the rain in Spain falls mainly on the plane. <laughs> so so the, the long proboscis uh, was, was functional in addition to being awesome. It was, was filled with herbs and spices in an attempt to purify the air as it passed through. I guess the idea is that if it doesn't smell bad, it must not be bad for you. And then the doctors would further be covered head to toe. They would have hoods, long coats, and gloves. These were made out of leather, often goat skin. 
sometimes wax fabric, all in an effort to protect the plague doctor from the bad air. They would usually carry a stick so they wouldn't have to touch the patients. Talk about bedside manner. And I suppose you can kind of palpate somebody that way, but ooh. And here, here's a Lex, here are a couple of less picturesque versions of these masks. They're pretty rudimentary. But so a, a brief aside, so in, in the 14th century, the, the French, uh, the Parisian Medical Academy released a report on the plague and they, they had their no notions as to the causes and how people could avoid the plague. And these are some of my favorite bits for, for how you can avoid the plague. So if any of you want to be healthy tonight, you should take all these to heart. Good, clear wine should be selected and drunk often, but in small quantities by day. Olive oil, as an article of food, is fatal. In order to keep the body properly open, an enema or some other simple means should be employed when necessary. <laughs> Chef's right. <laughs> Bathing is injurious. Men must preserve chastity as they value their lives. Women are evidently too free uh, to do as you see fit, so make of that what you will. So I'd like to do an exercise here. Please, if you don't mind, close your eyes for a moment and picture yourself in 1630 in a small town outside of Florence. You're nine years old and you're sick. You're in pain. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate the audience participation. The, you, you're sick. You're in. You're in pain. You're afraid. You have delirious with fever, and you don't really understand what's going on. But you manage to catch a little bit of sleep, and you wake to the sound of a stranger in your house, and open your eyes, and the first thing you see is somebody that looks like this. Yeah. Please state the nature of the medical emergency. So as I was, was researching the plague and plague doctors, my, my favorite source was written by a German guy named Hecker, and it was published in 1832, so before germ theory, and, and translated from German in 1888, and it has this uh, really beautiful evocative language, so I'm gonna share a little bit of it with you. In many places, not more than two in 20 of the inhabitants survived. Many were struck as if by lightning and died on the spot. And this more frequently among the young and strong than the old. Every spot which the sick had touched, their breath, their clothes spread the contagion. And as in all other places, the attendants and friends who were either blind to their danger or heroically despised it, fell a sacrifice to their sympathy. No sooner did these fatal signs appear than they bid adieu to the world and sought consolation only in the absolution which Pope Clement VI promised them in the hour of death. Their sufferings continued without alleviation until terminated by death, which many in their despair accelerated by their own hands. The last one's my favorite. Flight was of no avail to the timid, for even though they had sedulous, sedulously avoided all communication with the diseased and the suspected, yet their clothes were saturated with the pestiferous atmosphere, and every inspiration imparted to them the seeds of the destructive malady, which, in the greater number of cases, germinated with but too much fertility. So, so yeah, pretty metal. So, in, in addition to a lot of death and fear, there were other effects from the plague. Um, economies, of course, were devastated from, from that much death. So there was some horrible persecution of Jews because some people saw fit to, to blame them for, for the disease. Um, but uh, one of the, the interesting theories, and it's just a theory, is that the plague helped to spur the Renaissance because the disease was more likely to impact poorer people just because of crowding. And so each time there was an outbreak, the number of laborers relative to the, the rest of the population was increasingly small, and so they had increased bargaining power. In, in modern times, we still occasionally see cases of the plague, but they're few and far between, and, and they're very well contained. Uh, plague, these plague doctors appear all over the place in our, in our art, of course, and there are numerous books with Plague Doctor in the title. Most of them are mysteries. And then one is, is this thing, which I really don't know what to do with. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't order that. Um, 
Plague, Doctor, uh, it, Plague Doctors appear in video games, of course, and there are numerous companies that will sell you a plague mask, and these range from $15 cheapies to beautiful handmade works of art. And of course, there are steampunk variations of these plague, plague masks because we need steampunk variations of everything. <laughs> Ships, indeed. My favorite manifestation, though, of, of the Plague Doctor imagery is these guys, the spy versus spy. And even though, yes, I know they're spies and not doctors, damn it, Jim, but the, the, the visual resemblance is, is unmistakable. And in modern times, we have organizations, we have infrastructure to uh, prevent disease and to prevent spread of disease when it occurs. We have... We had shifts, right. Um, biotechnology has given us this incredible tool set that we're using to advance medicine, and that's going to continue for a very long time. And so looking back, I am in awe of how far we've come. It would have been very easy for all of these pandemics to set civilization back hundreds of years. It may well have reduced us to barbarism, but it didn't. Instead, we got, as we saw from Trey, all sorts of wonderful art. But in addition to that, science, and, and, and literature, and music. And so humanity, we as a species, faced a really incredible challenge. And despite all of our fear, which was not inconsiderable, and all of our ignorance, which was vast, both known and unknown. We put our shoulders in, and we did the work, and we persisted. And I don't know about you, but I take comfort in that. So please join me in raising a glass to persistence.